A significant portion of the New Testament consists of the life and writings of St. Paul. In the book of Acts, we learn about Saul of Tarsus and his persecution of the early Christians, his conversion, and then his missionary work and his travels throughout the known world. We also find several of St. Paul's letters to individuals and various early Christian communities. Saul was born in Tarsus, which is in modern-day Turkey, and was a place of high culture and education at the time. He enjoyed dual citizenship, which means he was a Jewish man, but also enjoyed the social and political benefits of being a Roman citizen. He spoke Hebrew and Greek, and his name, Saul, means asked of Yahweh. And Paul, or Paulus, is simply the Roman version of his given name. Saul, or St. Paul, could trace his lineage back to the tribe of Benjamin. If that rings a bell, it is probably because the first king of Israel, Saul, also traced his lineage back to the same tribe of Benjamin. Saul was highly educated in the tradition of the Pharisees, and he studied under the renowned Rabbi Gamaliel. As persecution of the early Christians scatters the followers of Jesus into Judea and Samaria and beyond, Saul, who later goes by the name Paul, seeks to track them down. While Christians flee to many villages and cities, it is Damascus where Saul puts his focus, as there was quite a large Jewish population living in that area at the time. While he was on his way to Damascus, he has this conversion experience. There is a flash of sudden light and a voice from heaven says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? When Saul asks who is speaking, the answer is more astonishing than the bright light. It responds, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Jesus had already died, risen, and ascended to heaven, but the voice is clear. It is Jesus that Saul persecutes when he persecutes Christian men and women. Saul is blinded from the encounter. As he sits blinded by the light of Christ for three days, he begins to grasp a deeper revelation of who Jesus is, an insight that profoundly shapes his understanding of the church. Reflecting on Jesus' question, why do you persecute me? Saul realizes that Jesus identifies himself with his disciples. God sends another one of his followers, Ananias, to heal Saul. And as he does, something like scales fall from Saul's eyes and his sight is restored. Following his dramatic conversion experience, Saul, who now becomes known as Paul, preaches throughout the Mediterranean world. He faces opposition, persecution, prison, and eventually even death. But God uses Paul to bring the good news of the gospel of Jesus to the Gentiles and establish and lay the foundation for his church throughout the Roman world. The letters of St. Paul all find their context in these missionary journeys and travels that we hear about in the book of Acts. However, the way they are organized in the Bible is by their length. So the letter to the Romans is the longest of Paul's letters, and it is the sixth book in the New Testament. So you have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then the book of Acts, and then the next book in the New Testament would be the letter to the Romans. One of my favorite verses in Scripture is from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. It's found in chapter 8, verse 28, and it reads, We know that God works everything for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I think it's a 
a very reassuring, a comforting, and empowering message that God works everything for the good. So no matter what we may be experiencing or going through, if we stay close to God, he will bring good out of any situation. The next two books of the New Testament are the first and second letters to the Corinthians. And Corinth was an established and wealthy Roman colony during the time. However, it was also one of the most corrupt. Paul begins his first letter to the Corinthians emphasizing the crucifixion of Christ. The cross is countercultural and turns the wisdom and power of the world upside down for jews demand signs and greeks seek wisdom but we preach christ crucified a stumbling block to jews and foolishness to gentiles but to those who are called both jews and greeks christ is the power of god and the wisdom of god paul concludes his letter with a focus on jesus's resurrection thus Paul frames his first letter to the Corinthians with the death and resurrection of Jesus, showing how the paschal mystery of Jesus frames the Christian life. Paul was imprisoned on multiple occasions, and there are a group of letters that are believed to have been written um, while he was imprisoned. The letters to Philemon, the Colossians, the Ephesians, and the Philippians are what are known as the prison letters. St. Paul calls himself an ambassador in chains. And if you think of what an ambassador is, it's someone who goes into a foreign land and represents their country or their nation. And in Paul's case, he is in the world representing the heavenly nation or kingdom of God. Given St. Paul's trials and tribulations and the persecutions he faced, St. Paul is able to experience things that help shape his perspective and his attitude toward life. And one of the more famous quotes from St. Paul comes from Philippians in chapter 4, verse 13. For I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I believe what St. Paul learned and, and realized in his own life was that no matter what the circumstances around him may be, as circumstances have a tendency to shift, um, can go from good to bad, better to worse. He realized that the one constant in his life was his faith and his relationship with Jesus. And with Jesus, he can do all things and handle anything that life may throw down his path. St. Mother Teresa also offers a similar reflection um, almost 2,000 years after St. Paul. And it's interesting to note that while they really lived in two completely different worlds at two completely different times in history, they both have this understanding of Christian joy that is not dependent on circumstances. As you see, it is rather dependent on one's relationship with the Lord and is an abiding, deeply spiritual quality of life. So these two great saints offer us this reflection, and it's certainly a, a message and a lesson that can uh, reassure us and strengthen us, especially in times of lack or times of struggle. <music>